Good morning, everybody. Happy Wednesday. We have an amazing show for everybody today. What do we have, Crystal? Indeed we do. We've got great friend of the show, David Day, and Ani's got a deep dive into Nancy Pelosi's career and especially her utter failures during this particular crisis. So it'll be great to talk to him about that. We also have uh, the head of Gallup on to talk about some sort of stunning new polling about the way Americans feel about America right now. But we wanted to start with some new reporting from the Washington Post about the way that uh, candidates are not going going after Biden the way that they yeah. did with Hillary Clinton. Yeah, this is really fascinating stuff from Dave Weigel over there at the Washington Post. And he basically shows that of the TV ad buys and ad analytics, that only six commercials by Republican candidates for House or Senate have been bothered with Biden, focusing more on Nancy Pelosi or AOC. <laughs> now, this is pretty stunning because if we think about 2016, I don't know if Dave has the numbers about this, but just anecdotally, I'm sure oh, yeah. he does as well. Hillary's face was the picture of the Democratic Party. Every single, I mean, I'm from Texas. What we're used to when we turn on the TV in election season is you see Hillary's face, Nancy Pelosi's face, or Obama's face. That's it, right? Even if the person that they're running against is like a three-time veteran, they're like, they're like Nancy Pelosi. They're going to take their order yes. from Nancy Pelosi, and they're voted for Barack Obama. That's it. This time around, they don't seem to have any of the same level of animus towards Biden. And we can kind of see this through the Trump campaign's kind of inability to define Biden because they're moving around all the time. First, it was Biden on China. Then, of course, Sleepy Joe has kind of been an omnipresent thing. But Sleepy Joe seems to be working and is up by, you know, 14 points in the polls. So <laughs> people kind of want Sleepy. That people sounds kind of good. Yeah, Sleepy <laughs> sounds fine when 80 percent of the country <laughs> thinks that we're on the wrong track. So what exactly should you brand Biden as? And I think this is really something that your radar was on like two days ago, which is that they forgot why they're running, yeah. which is the reason why that Hillary worked. Sure. All the 30 years of negatives and all of that. It was about the system. And Trump was running against the system. He was running in order to replace it with a new systems in a way that we distribute well, that we think about jobs and we think about trade and all these other things. All of that seems to have been lost in recent days. So whenever you're running against Biden on purely aesthetics, it's not the same thing. Yeah. And that's just something that I think why, the reason it's not landing. I mean, Crooked Hillary was like an ethos. It was like something that Crooked Hillary was about the entire system of Washington. But then they didn't really do all that much about the system of Washington when they got here. So then it's just, you know, talking about balances and aesthetics. And at that point, people are just going to say, eh, maybe I'm not with you anymore. Well, even beyond that, I mean, the line that we hear from the Trump campaign and yeah. that the president's been touting himself, right. and that, you know, Newt Gingrich and everybody else is out there. They're like, oh, Joe Biden's a puppet of the radical left. And it just like it's ridiculous. I mean, people look at this guy and also partly he benefits from the fact that he had a lot of candidates to his left, like Bernie Sanders in the primary. And so he, you know, has been this corporatist, centrist, down the line, moderate Democrat, much to my chagrin, over his long career. They know he's not going to be anything really different in office. So the idea that he's like some radical leftist, it just seems ridiculous. Yeah, well, it doesn't land whatsoever. I mean, the, the right approach would be to basically go after him the way that you did with Hillary, mm -hmm. that he's a part of the problem. He's a part of the establishment, the bad trade deal the bad wars, all of that. But I will give them the fact that it's much harder to prosecute that case. We thought before coronavirus that Trump would basically be able to run with the advantages of incumbency, but still as an outsider. Yes. Now, given the crisis of coronavirus and the protest movement, he no longer has the luxury of running as an outsider because people wanted him to step up into that role of commander in chief, leader of the nation and president. So rather than being an outsider, He's like a failed leader. And then it's harder to level that charge of like, you're the insider, you're the part of the problem against Joe Biden, because what's happening right now is very much a failure of leadership within well, the Trump administration. What happened is the political dynamics got switched, which is that people generally prefer outside to incumbency. So Trump could run as the outsider as long with the incumbency. But in a leader, in a crisis like yeah. this, you actually want incumbency. You want kind of that power of government. You yeah. want somebody up there who's just like, hey. Who has it under control. I have a handle on the reins. Yeah. It's funny, you know, I asked the Trump campaign, I think this is why you were gone. I said, you guys keep saying this radical left thing. Like, wh where is this coming from? What they pointed to was abortion. And I was like, so when you're talking about social issues, okay, that's when, whenever people, whenever I'm like, there is radical left, I'm like, yeah, he agrees with like, 
the left on increasingly left trending social issues, but they are in a, unable to distinguish that on economics. And I think that that is why it just sounds so ridiculous. I mean, they always talk about the Green New Deal thing. I mean, it's just not true, right? Like, right. They're, like <laughs> try, they're like, Biden is signing on that Green New Deal. And again, because I spend time here on this show and I, you know, we had the Sunrise Movement on, and I right. was like, why don't you like Joe Biden? They're like, we're giving it an F. I'm like, okay, well, it doesn't sound like you signed on to the Green New Deal. <laughs> I mean, you don't, and again, you don't even need to attack the Green New Deal. You just be like, Play that clip of him from the debate saying he'll sacrifice millions of blue collar jobs in order to, or he'll sacrifice millions of blue collar jobs for green regulation. That's not a Green New Deal. Just play it. Right. Play it over and over again. He said, and this would, if I was them, I'd be like, he said that he would sacrifice millions of blue collar jobs. Why is it so hard? Right. It's like they try and they're trying to like twist themselves into pretzels. And there was a good quote actually in this story saying Hillary had 30 years of hard negatives. And so same with Nancy Pelosi. They were in a spotlight. Vice President Biden operating in Joe Biden, in Barack Obama's shadow just wasn't. And Biden has been adept at not taking the bait on stuff like defund the police or the Green New Deal. He just doesn't come off as polarizing. It's true. Biden went out there and said, keep Christopher Columbus and George Washington statues up. That was the whole thing. He like, said, if, in if response, he hadn't said that, he would have been massacred. But he in said In response it. to defund like, the police, he's yes. actually like, no, let's fund yeah, the, like, police. the police. More. Which, again, again, much to my chagrin, well, like, yours, I don't want him to go in that direction. because but people don't want to defund the police. And so it's it, like, it makes it, imp- I mean, you're just not going to be able to peg this guy as a radical leftist. So figure something else out. Right. Sleepy Joe is just not as interesting as Crooked Hillary. And by the way, look, it's a nickname that was given before this particular political right. moment. And calm, sleepy, like the ability to just kind of go back to sleep and not be terrified of your life and losing your job every day. Yeah, that actually sounds pretty good, which is why Biden is doing so incredible. I mean, I don't think we can even really, I really don't think you can understate how well he's done and is doing right now with seniors when this is a demographic that not just under Trump, but for a long time has been like the bedrock of Republican victories and Republican Republican success, the fact that they've moved over to Biden is a really big deal. One other metric from this article from uh, Weigel is that conservative publisher Regnery was selling eight books about Hillary Clinton by this point last election cycle. Um, They had 13 books about Barack Obama in the 2012 election cycle by this time. Right now they have one about Biden calling him a crypto socialist. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think that's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. The other metric, which I thought was really interesting, this is about third party voters from 2016. Let's throw this up there on the screen. It just says some who voted for third party candidates in 2016 say they're so disillusioned with President Trump, they're increasingly willing to back Joe Biden in 2020, a dynamic that could have implications in some of the most competitive battleground states. Of course, you know, Green Party won like one or two percent in many of these competitive states, but yeah, you know, maybe it matters. Mattered. And really what it is, is that that goes to show you again, I mean, much to my chagrin, which is that people are not voting for Biden. People are voting against Trump. And yeah. so that's why it's not hard if you're Trump to just turn, you could turn things around. He could make it so that people wanted to affirmatively vote for something with a positive vision for the country. I mean, you saw that he had that disastrous Sean Hannity interview where they're like, what are you going to do in the second term? And he just like, didn't really know the answer. And it was like, Again, I mean, I don't know. I ask these guys. I'm like, what are you going to do in your second term? Well, they built the economy once. We'll build it again. What does that mean? Are we going to have better trade with China? Are we going to have more onshore manufacturing? Are we going to have different tax uh, tax liabilities? Are we going to, you know, pursue like a new industrial policy? Are we going to have an infrastructure plan? I mean, I don't know. We haven't heard any of that. I haven't heard any of that. I mean, I would vote for that. But that's part of the issue, which is that when you're not selling like a positive vision for the country, it's just amorphous. It's just like seeding out there in nothing. And people are beginning to take notice. I mean, I pointed this out and I think it's hilarious, which is JP Morgan, Wall Street is beginning, they're becoming very comfortable with Joe Biden for president. Check this out. <laughs> they should JP be. Morgan, the consensus view is a democratic victory in November will be negative for equities. However, we see this outcome as neutral to slight positive. So basically what they're saying is, yeah, you know, stocks might take a little hit. We might pass this, but overall we'll be all right. I mean, that's the, that's the general consensus view all throughout Wall Street. They're, they're telling us publicly we are totally cool with Joe Biden for president. So he's got 
the Capitol behind him. He's got Hollywood and everybody behind him. Then he's got everybody who's just anti-Trump and may not even disagree with him behind him. That's how you create like a juggernaut presence. And then people are just pissed off about how Trump handled coronavirus. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. We've been talking for a while now about how the key metric to watch may be people who hate both candidates. Like the, you know, the pox on both their houses. People, because those individuals went overwhelmingly for Trump or some of them voted third party last time around. What that article in the New York Times, and actually there's another one out with some polling data around kind of the left, like Elizabeth Warren voters is no surprise to us. They're all 100% with yeah, Joe Biden. Yeah. Bernie Sanders voters from the primary, the numbers were like 87 to 4. Mm-hmm. So it was also a much more sort of lockstep vote for Biden than it was for Hillary last time around. Now, partly some of the people who voted for Bernie and then switched to Trump, like they're still with Trump. They right. just left the Democratic Party and they're on that side now. But um, it shows you that, you know, people who look, young voters are not excited about Joe Biden. I'm not excited about Joe Biden. Like no one is really excited about Joe Biden, but especially younger voters and folks who back Bernie Sanders. But they still are planning to vote for him. Yeah, and, and that metric of like the people who do not like either candidate, whether it's from the left or the sort of Republicans who held their nose and they hated Hillary and so they backed Trump last time, those folks are also coming over to Biden. Um, On the Wall Street piece, there's a big New York Times write-up about this as well. And basically, they said the questions that are coming in as it's looking more and more likely that Biden will be the president is about that corporate tax cut, of course, that the Trump administration, that was like their signature issue, giving away tons of money to corporations, that they then turned around and use, we were told they were going to use them to like invest in workers and it was going to lift wages. That None of that really happened. Instead, they just did sh- stock buybacks, which was great for their shareholders, right? It goosed um, the stock market. So that's the piece that they're worried about because Biden has said that he's going to roll that back. But other than that, yeah, nothing fundamentally will change is, is pretty much the deal. Remember this. The, and this is, I think, even more significant than the you ain't black moment. On that very same day in an interview he gave just minutes before, he revised the tax bracket. He said, I will never never raised taxes on anyone making over $400,000, yeah, yeah. which Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton in 08 and in 2016 both said that they would never raise taxes on anyone making over $250,000. So he increased the income up to 400 k of incomes that he won't touch. Why? Because he's never going to touch these new suburbanites. Many of these Wall Street analysts are making 350 grand or whatever. And that's that's the whole ball game. That's the base that's, of the party. That's why Wall Street is like, oh, yeah, you know what? We're, we're going to be fine. It's because, look, I mean, do you know how much money $400,000 is in, in terms of a general household income? It's immense. And, it's, I mean, I don't even know what that puts you in, maybe like top 2% or something like that. That's essentially what he said. And so you look at that and you're like, wow, okay, this is not, you know, no fun. I mean, he gave the whole game away in that one fundraiser over a year ago. Nothing will fundamentally I mean, that's, change. yeah, that's, that's, that's what people pretty much it. But you know what? At this point, just calming the yeah. waters, being a normal human being, like paying and wearing a mask. That's like the bar has been set exceptionally low. And Joe Biden is managing to meet that bar. Radical leftist, right. though he is. There you go. All right, we're going to tell you what's on our radar. So that's next.